So I, I shared with the worship team this morning when they were rehearsing, first of all, it's good to be back with you guys. I, uh, I greatly missed this family, and so I'm, I'm grateful for the prayers, I'm, I'm grateful for the safe travels, um, for how so many of you loved on, ooh, loved on uh, Addie while I was gone and checked in on her, how much that means to me. I, I greatly appreciate that, but it is, it's very good to be back home with you all. Um, so for the last, well, I guess I was back this past week, but for the last two Sundays, I was down in Miami. Uh, and I, I've told some of you, I was technically in the U.S., um, but I, I honestly forgot that I was. We were in, it's called Pinewood, and it is 80% Haitian and 20% Latino. Uh, so there were many days where the only people I spoke English to were the people on the trip. And the rest of the time, it was me saying, habla espanol un poquito. <laughs> and then they would just look at me and be like, oh, this guy's in trouble. Um, but I also got to speak uh, Iesus Gaetanu, that is Amharic, which is the language of Ethiopia, and that means Jesus is Lord. I learned that phrase and I repeated that regularly. I regularly said things like hermanos in Cristo, uh, brothers in Christ, and that would elicit a smile. Um, regularly said, where's Tim and Toby? Tim and Toby know this one, Jay-Z Reme U. And that is Jesus loves you in Creole. And that was a phrase I use regularly. Um, and all of those phrases drew, uh, you know, smiles from people and, and that immediate connection. The phrase I used um, that I made sure to learn very quickly and I used quite regularly is siempre tengo hambre, which basically means I'm always ready to eat. Um, and that, especially the people we were working for, they love to take care of us. And, and so I used that phrase to communicate myself to them so they understood who I was uh, but it was a good trip um, and I told the worship team this morning and it's so neat when the spirit does this when the spirit connects you know where my heart is where Matt's heart is where he's leading us uh, if you want to throw that first picture up there so you can see the team that I really spent most of the time with so in that picture you've got oh the two people in the front row with the polos they're Bolivian and then the, uh, then the two next to them, um, they are both Mexican. The guy standing next to me with the longer hair and the baseball hat, he's El Salvadoran. Baruch in the very back row is Ethiopian. And it was just an incredible picture for a week of that passage in Revelation of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation coming together to serve the Lord. The one night uh, that we were at this church, and we'll, we'll meet this church a little bit later on, um, but the one night we did dinner with them, and we were just there for, for three hours, three or four hours, just laughing like old friends. And these were people who were strangers two days ago. And it was, it was just a beautiful picture of the universal nature of Christ's love and the bond of family that is shared in Christ. Um, yeah, so I was in Miami, and as, as some of you may recall, I've said this before, I process through questions. I, I ask questions. That's kind of how my personality works. It's how my mind works. And what was neat is the team very quickly learned this. Uh, and so every day, different people would come up to me and be like, right, because after the first couple of days, we'd do our debrief every night. And I would say, all right, this is the question I was chewing on today. And by day two or three, people were coming up and they're like, all right, Sam, what's today's question, right? What's, what's today's question that we're chewing on? And so I just brought back some questions for you all that we're going to look at uh, this morning. Some of these questions, I think I have some answers to. Um, and I think our, our leadership has an idea of some of the answers too, and we're beginning to take steps to answer these questions. Some of these questions, I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure what it looks like, um, but this is kind of what God's burdened me. Some of these questions I've been wrestling with for years. There's one question we'll look at that part of it, I started asking this question six or seven years ago when we were still living in Pittsburgh. Um, and so this is just gonna be a good morning to, to look at you know, kind of where God's family is universally, what the scripture calls of us as God's family and as God's servants. Um, and we're just gonna work through those this morning. But again, it is, it's good to see your faces. I missed, I missed these faces. I miss these people. And so I'm glad to be back. If you will, join me in prayer before we begin. Lord, we thank you for how good you are. We thank you for all that you make possible for us in this life. And we thank you that this life is just a, a glimpse of what's to come, that we have so much to look forward to, that we have a hope that can't be shaken, that we have come to a kingdom that can't be shaken. What a privilege and an honor it is to be part of your family. And we thank you for that. 
And God, now as we begin to look at what you've been teaching me and, and where you've burdened me, I pray that this would be a time that is about you. This would be a time where you are speaking and where your people are listening with ears open by you. Uh, let it start here, God. May I be listening to you in this time. If there's anything of me in this, hide it. Get rid of it entirely. Let this, let this time be a conversation that is glorifying to you and pleasing to you uh, as we seek to, to just love you with all of who we are, as we relentlessly pursue your heart and looking like Jesus to the people around us, as we submit every day and every moment to your Spirit as he leads. And we ask that that would be true of this time as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we got down there on a Friday. We left, uh, what time did I leave the house? 3.30 Friday morning? 4 Friday morning? Um, too early. Way, way too early. But we got down there Friday, and our first day was called Renew the City. And we were told we were going to be at Boys and Girls Club. We were going to be at the local Boys and Girls Club helping out with some much-needed work. So my mind goes to, okay, cool, we're going to be building sports equipment. I love sports. Maybe we'll get to play with the kids. Like, this is going to be great. And then they're like, oh, you're going to be doing painting. Like, all right, sweet. Where's my industrial sprayer? Where's my big roller thing? Like, I'm ready. Let's do this. <laughs> and I show up. You see all those pretty little flowers and polka dots and butterfly wings? I was given a paintbrush that was about that big. And I was told, Sam, you've got the flower mural. And then I finished the flower mural. I didn't have to do the lettering. I just got to do the little butterfly wings and the polka dots. And then I got to move on, and they gave me a paintbrush that was a little bit bigger, and I got to outline one of the silhouettes in the quote. And I, I got to be honest, this was, this was humbling. Um, you're going to see, I, I'll, I'll be very transparent, you're going to see some times in this past week where I believe I, I was behaving according to Scripture, and I think I set a pretty good example. I'm also going to share with you guys some times where God had to teach me a lesson and remind me of who I am. This was one such lesson. Uh, we show up to do the painting. I'm, I'm giving, I'm giving like, you know, my little toddler's first paintbrush, and I'm told to go paint polka dots and butterfly wings. And I was like, wow, I know how to do so much more. I've done so much more. This is, this is such an inefficient use of what I'm capable of doing. This is really like you brought us down to do this and then a guy named Eugene stepped up and started working next to me and Eugene is the program director of the boys and girls club and Eugene broke down twice in gratitude that we came down there to do this project for them see this hallway that we were painting these murals in it's where the kids spend the most time it's where they're dropped off it's where they have to wait to be picked up in this hallway has just the building, the Boys and Girls Club was built in 1932 and it's never once been like new building sections. They'll do like patch jobs here or there. This building's old. And this hallway that these kids spend the most of their time in just waiting, staring at the walls, was old and crumbling and decrepit and in just brutal neglect. And Eugene said the kids felt like that. They felt like the city had a space for them, but they didn't actually care, right? Like here, we'll give you our cast offs. We'll put you in a space that doesn't really reflect that we actually care about you and want you to have something nice. So as we came in, we painted six different murals in this space. First, we cleaned up the wall. We painted a cool pattern at the bottom with the colors of the local school district. And then we painted these murals. And Eugene broke down twice saying how excited that as he told me, the kids, I told them you were doing this and they are so excited. They couldn't believe, one of the kids said, wow, people care that much that they're gonna come and fix up our hallway? And then I felt way smaller than that paintbrush that I had been given. And I had to ask myself, and even some of the kids, they, there was a basketball tournament that day, and so the hallway was closed off, but some of the kids snuck under the tape, and they, oh, that's Kobe. Oh, look, he's doing Martin Luther's face. Right? Like they were so excited to see this hallway transform. And so I started to have to ask myself, man, how many times have I missed out on what God is doing? Because in my mind, I've dismissed it at too trivial. Oh, that's, what? No, there's no way God wants me to really do that. That's such a small, insignificant gesture. And so we brush things aside. And the question that I ultimately came to is, really, what is God putting in our lives? What small tasks, what flower petal murals might God be putting in your everyday life that's an opportunity to glorify Him and serve Him? 
What small tasks are you tempted to write off as insignificant, but it's a gift from God, an opportunity to love people. Because as I talked to Eugene, I spent the day working next to Eugene, and as I talked to him, he was like, man, I can't believe you guys came down here. Like, this is crazy. And I got to talk to him about Jesus. Well, like, you know, we're doing this because we love God. And God calls us to love people and to serve people. Man, that's cool. That's so cool. Eugene had played semi-professional basketball. He was pretty good. He was, he was on teams with, you guys know the name Kevin Durant? Some of, some of you nod, some of you shake your heads. Kevin Durant, he's pretty good if you don't know Kevin Durant. Eugene and Kevin Durant were on the same team for four years. Eugene was a little bit behind Kevin Durant, so he went over to Europe for some development, developmental years, and he blew out both knees in a terrible just encore. So, so when Eugene says, I was good at basketball, like Eugene was good at basketball. But then basketball was taken away from him. And he said, all of a sudden, I'm wrestling with, okay, what am I supposed to do with my life? I'd made everything about basketball, and now that's gone. And so I had a chance to talk to Eugene while painting flower petals and outlining faces to talk to Eugene about what matters. So the question I want you guys asking yourselves is, what small things is God putting in your day-to-day life that's an opportunity for you to plant seeds of the gospel? That's an opportunity for you to point to Jesus, to give glory to God, to serve His people, to love His people. And we see this in Scripture. Verses that I love, 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Scripture is so abundantly clear, and these are just two examples, that everything is intentional. Everything we do is to be for God's glory. Letting that lady in front of you at the shopping line, right, because she's got two screaming kids, and she only has a few items that she's trying to juggle while holding the kit, and you're like, yeah, you know what, why don't you go in front of me? Wow, that, really? Yeah, Jesus loves you, go in front of me. Everything is an opportunity to point to God. I've told you the conversations I've had in Starbucks lines and Barnes and Noble, right? When we just start, when we change that perspective, and God really had to humble me on this day, because I'm sitting there painting, I'm like, one flower petal, two flower petal, three flower petal, this is pointless. Then Eugene was like, man, thank you. I was like, excuse me? And that was humbling. And I had to ask myself, whether I eat or drink or paint polka dots, am I doing this for the glory of the Lord? I love Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 25, verse 34. Jesus said, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these of my brothers, you did it to me. There is nothing that we can do that should not be done for the glory of God. And God had to use some butterfly wings to remind me of that. And that was day one. And so I want you asking yourselves, what opportunities... What might be in my everyday life at work or while I'm running errands where there's a chance to point to God and to love someone in his name? And then the next day was Sunday, and we spent Sunday at a church called La Alianza, and that is the guy in the polo, uh, Pastor Willie Sr., and his son Willie Jr., and uh, Willie Sr. is Bolivian, Willie Jr. is Mexican, and, or well, I mean, he's got, you know, Bolivian heritage, but he was born in Mexico. Um, and they've been in the States for, I think he said about 10 years. Uh, and they'd previously been at a mega church. This was pretty cool. They'd previously been, Willie Jr. is a great music, like great voice, loves the sound stuff. And so he was part of the worship team at a mega church in the area. And he was loving it. And it was going well for him. And his dad was also at the church and then felt called to plant a small church in this community. So his dad, Willie Sr., left, and Willie Jr. felt convicted to go with him. So they went from, Willie, Willie Jr. told me a story. He went from this mega church where he would, he would be backstage and he'd have somebody clipping them in and miking them up, somebody preparing water for Like He said, I, I had my own personal team of 10 musicians 
and we were just one of teams in rotation. And then God brought him to a church where at 52, he is the youngest person in the church. And there's like a dozen, maybe two dozen people. And so worship for them at their church is he plugs in his iPad and he hits play on YouTube and then he sings along in a handheld mic. But he followed God. And so we got to worship Sunday with them. And then we went back Monday and Tuesday to do some project work for them. I mentioned this was a, you know, he's 52. He's the youngest person there. They had a lot of work that they needed done that they just, they don't have the physical capacity to do. And the question that God really just impressed on my heart and mind over these two days working for him, because when we showed up, and I don't, I mean nothing by this other than the facts, because they, this is how it was told to us. South American culture, the idea of a work schedule is kind of, ah, that's a nice concept. And so Sunday, we're like, hey, we're going to be here tomorrow to work. We've got these projects. Are you ready for us? Yeah, 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 we're ready for you. Hey, we're going to be there at 8.30. Will you be there? Yeah, yeah, totally. And you have all the supplies we need. Yeah, yeah, totally. So we show up, and they're not there. And so we just kind of hang out in the parking lot, waiting by the locked doors. And they roll in a little bit late, and they start talking. You know, how are you? And, and Matt, the team leader from Envision, is like, like, we only got, you know, let, let's, let's get to work. And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 we'll do the work. So they start walking us through, and I'm, I'm project leader of the one section. Eric's project leader of the other section. We're coordinating. We know what we have to do, the area. They show us where we're going to be working. I'm like, all right, you stay. You get any more details. I'm going to grab the rest of the team. We're going to go start moving the lumber, like all the supplies and stuff, right? And they're like, okay. So I grabbed Dan, our translator. I was like, hey, can you ask him where all the building material is so we can start moving it out here and setting up? Like, you know, senior, where's the building material? He's like, oh, well, we got to go get it. Like, 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 you mean like get it from like the shed in the back or like a house? No, no, like we got to go to Home Depot. Oh, like the Home Depot right now, it's like 40 minutes away. Fantastic. And my impatience is like, okay, excellent. We're, uh, we're now spending like a solid hour and a half, two hours doing nothing. And so I rode with Willie Jr. I had the cut list, I had the material list. I rode with Willie Jr. And I very quickly discovered that once again, I had missed the point entirely. Because Willie Jr. desperately needed to talk to somebody who could just encourage him. He was exhausted. He's trying to do everything. I mean, he loves this church. He believes his dad is such a, a beautiful man of God, the passion he brings. And they are just, they're exhausted. And so Willie Jr. and I got to have an hour and a half conversation where I could just, and brother, you're not in this alone. We got to talk about Isaiah. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And when we got back with the lumber in the back, we just got out of the car and I went to go grab the boards and start unloading. And Willie just gave me a hug. And he was like, man, I needed that. Let's get to work. And we started getting to work. And the two days we were there, I mean, so when you think about missions trips, right? You think about, oh, Sam's on a mission trip. Surely he's helping, you know, the homeless or somebody like, you know, the hurricane just came through and they're re rebuilding a house. Like, you were building closets and doing some work for another church? But what God had to remind me is just this beautiful lesson that the church was given for one another. And while we're helping this church, I mean, Willie Sr., the lead pastor, he broke down half a dozen times just saying thank you as he watched the work complete, as, they, as he watched the progress move along. He just kept, I can't believe you guys gave your time to come help us in this way. The ladies of the church, the families, that they'd show up every day to see our product, and they'd walk in and they'd say, oh, and they'd start crying. And then they would go make us lunch, and that was why I learned to say, I'm always ready to eat, so that we could communicate. But it was so meaningful to them that people who don't even know them, the only connection we have is we both love Jesus and serve him, would give their time to help them and to serve their ministry. And it started me thinking, I was like, and I wonder how many churches here in Richland County don't have anybody who's physically... I mean, think of the work that we just got done over the last couple months here. The people who showed up and gave their time, lended their skill and their expertise and their physical ability to do the work. And I was like, man, I wonder how many churches 10 minutes from us desperately need help. Part of our team was repairing a ceiling. The roof was breaking. They had water dripping it. And so they replaced, they, they fixed it. And I'm like, man, I wonder how many churches within 10 minutes of us, how many of our own family 
in our backyard need help and we've just never thought to ask. And so I started asking, what opportunities do we have to serve and love the local church? And when I say church and church, I mean that intentionally. This is a, this is a ecclesia. The people gathered in this room, we are a small C church. Then you have the global church, the big church, the Richland County capital C church. And so I started asking myself, what opportunities are we missing to love our own family, to take care of our own family? Because again, this is something that we see in Scripture. Consider these verses. This is Leviticus 25, 35. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 8, If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Romans 12, 13, Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Hebrews 6, 10, for God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. Throughout scripture, we see that the body has been created and given to one another for the purpose of loving one another, of coming alongside one another, of building each other up, of helping each other when it's hard. I told you one of these questions, part of this question about how do we come alongside the local family. This is something, six years ago we were in Pittsburgh and I was leading a devotional. We were working our way through Acts and I was given Acts 2. And Acts 2, 42 to 47 just froze me dead in my tracks. Acts 2, 42 is where it talks about they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, the fellowship of the prayer. And then it goes on to talk about they got together daily, breaking bread in their houses, giving thanks to the Lord. They were constantly meeting. And so this question for six, seven years has been rattling around in my mind is, what does Acts 2, 42 to 47 look like in a modern context? I believe the church has become so fragmented from one another. We've started when I said that some questions I think I have the answers to, some questions I don't know the full answers to. This is something that's it's been a burden on my heart now for years. And we've been able to connect with some other people in this area who are burdened in the same way. Dale over at the MAC, the guys over at the MAC, they, they, they're burdened by this as well. That's why we had Dale over here to do a video, one of our midweek videos. That's why I went over there to preach because we believe in church collaboration and church relationship. We want to be there to help one another. And I want that to be true for the larger context as we help other churches in this area, but I also, I really want this to be true for this body for this family. I mean, I want these verses. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself, you support him. If among you, your brother can become poor, don't shut your hand. Open it to him. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Bear one another's burdens. Serve one another. And so I'm asking, I'm asking the question of, what does this look like? What opportunities do we have as a congregation? What opportunities do you have as individuals to love and support one another, to encourage one another, to build one another up? But then it's also, I'm going to ask you guys a question personally. Talk to us, talk to us, talk to us, talk to us. Because I, I can't promise you, if you come to me with a need, if you come to James with a need, if you come to one of the elders with a need, you say, hey, we have this very real need in our family, I can't promise you that we'll always be able to address it perfectly. I wish I could. I wish I could say, man, I don't care how large the bill is. I don't care if you need a house, a car, like we will have, we've got a magic garage that I will have a fleet of cars if your car ever breaks down. Like I wish I could say that, but I can't promise that we'll always be able to help everyone perfectly entirely. But I can promise you this, if you don't bring a need to us, there's zero chance we'll address it. If you need help and you don't come to us, I can guarantee that we're not going to do a thing to address it. Right? I'm mad at Mike because three weeks ago I needed to use a car for a day and he wouldn't let me use his car. Well, Mike, in fairness to you, I never said anything to you. I just thought you would read my mind. No, you guys need to talk to us. And if you know a church in this area, I mean, like, dead serious, like, this is a very specific thing. If you know a church in this area, I know so many of us have lived here for years and we're, we're all connected. If you know a church in this area that needs physical help, that can't do work around their property, that, that is in desperate need of assistance, let us know.
please, I, I want us to be a church that cares for the body, that lives out these commands in Scripture. And serving at Kendall and seeing how much it meant to them reminded me of this. And then there's one more question with Kendall. We were supposed to be there Monday and Tuesday, and because of different delays, because of different hiccups, we didn't get the work done that they thought we were going to get done in two days because we were constantly getting set back. And so they're like, okay, well, the work's half finished, but thank you. I mean, thank, they were blown away. They were so grateful, right? This isn't Kendall's part. The church at Kendall was so grateful for the work we did. And they were like, thank you, go, enjoy the rest of you. You know, have a great rest of the trip. We're praying for you guys. And it, it didn't sit well with myself and the other project leader that the work was undone. And so we looked at our schedule and envisioned they'd tried to be gentle to us and kind to us. They built in kind of an off day where we got to sleep in a little bit. It was in between two really labor-intensive days. So they tried to build in an off day where we could relax. And myself and the other, Eric and I looked at each other and we we're like, we're, we're not okay with this. This work's unfinished. And if we don't finish this, it very realistically could sit there for another year and not get done. So we went to the rest of the team. Before we went to anyone else, we went to the rest of the team. We're like, guys, we're asking if you'd be willing to give up our off day to go back to Kendall and finish the work. And the team unanimously said, yeah, absolutely. So then we went to the Envision people and we said, hey, we want to... We want to give up our off day to go back to Kendall. And they're like, are you serious? We're like, yeah, we need to finish that work. And when he called Pastor Willie, when we showed up on that Friday, we weren't supposed to be there, he greeted each of us with a hug. He said, I can't believe you would do that. And so the question I want us to ask ourselves is, what are we willing to sacrifice to finish this task set before us? I mean, we gave up something so trivial. That's not a pat on the back. Like, I've been to the beach. I've seen it. I know what sand looks like. I, I didn't sacrifice. Like, that's such a small example. But the principle applies. What are we willing to sacrifice to work at the task ahead of us? What are we willing to give up to complete what God has laid before us? We need to be willing to ask ourselves this individually and corporately as a church. Then we went to uh, South Beach. And this is, when you think of Miami, this is what you're thinking of. You're thinking of South Beach. You're thinking of the beach gyms. You're thinking of everybody in the rich. I mean, I saw more Maseratis on our day to South Beach than I've ever seen. We passed a literal Maserati dealership. If you don't know what a Maserati is, it's a car that we could all pool our money and maybe buy like a wheel of. And we passed an actual dealership, right, where they just have stock of this. I'm like, this is crazy. And so we're at South Beach, and we were doing evangelism. We were just doing street evangelism. And we were going up, and I, the conversations we had on this day were crazy. And so we finished with our street evangelism, and praise God, I mean, really get ready to celebrate, two people came to Christ during this street evangelism. Like that, yeah, there we go. So we finish with our street evangelism. We're like, wow, I mean, we are, we're freaking out, right? Like, this is a great day. Two people came to Christ. This is incredible. And so we get back to the park where we're eating lunch before we go, and we set up lunch, and we're going to meet. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Baruch later on. But Baruch immediately, he sees that not everybody needs to set up the lunch. So Baruch grabs his guitar and just starts playing worship music. And we all start singing in. And we sounded terrible. <laughs> like, oh my God, like, I have a bad voice, and I know this. And there were people there with a better voice than me, but not many. Like, it was rough, right? Like, Baruch had a good voice, Danielle had a good voice, and that was kind of the extent of it. But we're just, we're singing worship music while we're setting up lunch under a tree. And this, this kid named Andreas comes over. And we almost don't even recognize it because we're wrapping up the worship music. We, we start praying for the meal, and Andreas comes over and stands in the circle with us. We open our eyes, and we're like, oh, there's a stranger standing next to us. Cool. And Matt, the Envision team leader, is like, hey, man, what's up? You want to stay for lunch? He's like, yeah, I heard your music. I came over. We're like, all right, sweet. Somebody's like, oh, like, so you know the songs? And he's like, yeah, 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 Jesus. And he like, points, he's got like four crucifixes on. Like, oh, cool, yeah, Jesus, awesome. So we sit down. We start uh, talking to Andreas. And the questions I want you to keep in your mind for this is, are we ready for the people God drops in our laps? Because we thought we were done with evangelism. We were, we were done, right? Our schedule, on the schedule, it said evangelism was over at 2.30, right? And then Andreas comes over, he's like, yeah, yeah, Jesus. And we're like, oh, cool, evangelism's done, let's just eat. And we start talking to Andreas, right? He's a stranger, we're talking to him. And, and as we're listening to him, we're like, man, I don't think he knows Jesus. 
this guy's broken. He, he has no idea about mercy or grace or hope. And so we start asking questions. And we're like, yeah, well, let's talk about this. I mean, God literally dropped them in our laps. And so I wonder how many people has God dropped in our laps in our day-to-day -day life and we're not ready for these conversations. And when we have these conversations, I want you to ask yourself, are you really listening to the answers? Because if we were just kind of listening at the survey, oh, Andreas says he knows Jesus, cool. You know, hey, Andreas, what do you like to do at the beach? But instead we ask, like, you know, hey, what, how long have you been in Miami? Oh, well, just two days. Oh, cool, did you move here for a job? No, not really. Well, do you mind, you know, what brought you here? Well, I, I ran away from home. Oh, man, we're, we're sorry to hear that. You know, if you want to talk about it, we're, we're willing to listen. And he just starts pouring out this broken story. And with every question or every answer, we're asking deeper questions about, oh, man, that's, that's hard. So what did that do to you? You know, like, how did that impact you? What does that mean for your life? And we're just talking to him. And then the last question I want to say is, I tell you Andreas' story, I want to tie in that bottom question. How, and this goes back to the previous question. How can we collaborate with one another for kingdom work? Because the coolest thing happened in Andreas' story. Baruch's music caught his ear and brought it. Definitely wasn't our singing. Like, nobody's showing up to hear our singing, right? Baruch's music caught his attention and drew him over. Matt invited him to stay. Eric immediately started talking to him and opened that conversation up. And then Andreas said something about, well, I've wrestled with substance abuse. That's been a problem in my family, right? Like, and I feel like I'm past forgiving. Like, nobody can forgive me. I'm too far gone. And Billy says, did you say substance abuse and past forgiveness? Yeah, I've overdosed 25 times. Billy's overdosed 25 times, and he was on this trip. Billy goes, dude, you want to talk about past forgiveness? Let's talk about my story. And Billy pours out his testimony for Andreas, and Andreas breaks down. He's like, oh, my goodness, God could forgive me? Yeah. Billy's like, wow. That was cool. I got to share my testimony, right? And then Andrea says, okay, so about this forgiveness, right? So now we've covered Baruch, Matt, Eric, Billy. Then he says, okay, so God could forgive me, but I don't know. I, I feel like there are people that I can't forgive. There's been sexual abuse inflicted on my family, and I, I can't forgive them. And I said, uh, can I tell you my testimony? My brother was sexually abused, and for years I refused it. Are you serious? Yeah, man. Let me tell you my testimony. Andreas breaks down. Wow. So Jesus gives me the new heart to forgive? Absolutely. And then he starts talking about, well, I should have figured that. You know, I kind of came to Miami to heal myself because I figured this would be healing for me. So I came to Miami to heal myself. You know, and I was like, well, I used to work in a pediatrician's office. The reason our patients came to us is because they can't heal themselves. He was like, yeah, I should have thought of that. I'm an RN. And Jenna goes, oh, you're an RN? I'm an RN. Let me share you my testimony. And every person on the team got a chance to interact with Andreas at this pivotal moment as we interacted with him throughout the day. It wasn't about one person. It wasn't one person who sat down and, and just talked to Andreas for two or three hours. We talked to him for 20 minutes. I mean, it was like, we're my wrestling fans, right? It was tag team. Like, oh, drug abuse? Billy, you're in. Oh, sex abuse and forgiveness? Sam, your turn. Right? Like, and we got to all take part in this as we work together for the kingdom. And Andreas is just, I mean, he's broken at this point. He's crying. He's, he's, he's desperate for hope. And some of them start walking to the beach. The one guy, Baruch, he'd never seen the ocean. So he's like, I got to go see the ocean. So they start walking to the beach. And Eric, who's been sitting there the whole time, not talking the whole time, but just listening, just sitting next to Andreas, says to him, he's like, man, it, it sounds like you don't have any hope in life. Andreas was like, no. And Eric said, do you want to hear about hope? And by the time they got to the beach, Andreas knelt down and prayed to receive Jesus. And a third person came to Christ that day. And then they started talking about baptism. He's like, well, there's water. Can I go get baptized? And they baptized him in the ocean. And it was the whole team, it was the whole body coming together to plant a seed, to water a seed, to further a seed. And that happened quick. I'm not saying that it's always going to happen that quickly. But it took all of us. It took all of us using who God has made us to be. It took all of us using the testimony that God has given to us to show Andreas the truth. And it was an awesome day. And then day seven, we were back. Uh, we were back at Kendall, like I said. 
And then it brought us to our very last day, day eight, or the last, the last work day. Uh, and if you, I think this died, if you want to go to the next one for me, please. It brought us back to our final work day at the campus. And that's, that's Adam in the, oh, this is where I'm really bad at this. It's Adam in the green shirt. There we go. That's easy. Adam's the one about to swing the sledgehammer. And I want to tell you the story about this concrete pillar. So this is not a planter. This is a bridge support that was supposed to be used as a, a bridge support on the highways that years ago someone put on the camp. They put four of them on the campus. And they were like, hey, we're going to turn these into planters. So that thing is six feet tall, a foot thick, with double reinforced rebar running through the middle. That comes into detail later. Because they've tried to take this thing down multiple times and it's fought them. When they first, when Envision first got the campus property, when Envision first got there, there was a face spray painted right, or painted right where Adam's about to hit with the sledgehammer. And they got there and they're like, wow, that's a pretty cool looking face, kind of weird. There's something a little bit off of, but the artwork's really impressive. Uh, cool. Ah, uh, you know what? We're trying to clean up the place anyway. We'll paint over it. So they paint over the face that was on this concrete just monstrosity, right? They later find out from somebody in the neighborhood, they're like, oh, I saw the face is gone, right? They later find out that if you know their religion, there's a religion, Santeria, which is all about devil worship. And the face in Santeria is a symbol that depending on who you ask, either means evil is welcome here or we celebrate evil here. And so they had this symbol painted on their property that was all about rejoicing over evil. And they were like, it's got to go down. And don't get like, they weren't saying, you know, this physical paint has power, but this was, I mean, think about it. If you woke up in your neighborhood and somebody had put up a massive concrete pillar with words written on it that said, we celebrate evil in this neighborhood. How many of you want to live across from that? How many of you are bothered by that? Not just this physical, I have to look at this every day, but there are people in this neighborhood where I'm trying to conduct ministry and they want the world to know that, no, 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 this place is going to be about evil. And so they were like, we got to take this thing down. And now I want to tell you about the guy in the polo and the baseball hat, which is not your typical work gear, right? The rest of us are in gloves and safety goggles. So as we start demolishing this, this, this was incredible. As we start working on this, tearing this monument to evil down, this guy is put, driving by on the street, and he, I mean, brakes screech to a stop, and he hops out of his car. He's like, what are you guys doing? And we're like, oh shoot, is this one of the Santeria people? Are they? And we're like, we're taking this, the translator's like, we're taking this down. And he's like, oh, I'm gonna be late to work for this. Can I get a few hits? This guy lived in the neighborhood and was so sick of seeing that face for years in his neighborhood. And he was like, yeah, I'm gonna be late to work to take a few swings at evil. The neighbor across the street came over when he heard the noise, he was like, what are you guys doing? We're like, is somebody about to fight? And he's like, doesn't speak any English. So we call one of our translators over and they tell him what he's doing. And he starts crying. And he's like, I gotta help. And he, gets, and he, he rearranges his whole day. He worked with us for five hours to help tear this down. A lady who used to live in that neighborhood wasn't even there that day. She's since moved out of that neighborhood. She drove past, she saw what we were doing. She pulled over and just started weeping and praying, saying, thank you, Jesus. And again, this, there's no, I, I don't think that when we not, with every new blow of concrete, evil got a little bit less, but these people had spent years seeing a declaration of evil in their lives. And they were so grateful that it was being removed. And it was hard work. My goodness. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. I'm in the back corner of the picture of the guy with the hat, and I've got a power chisel snugged into my shoulder. Just going, I mean, I had bruised. Like, it was 95 degrees with no, with no clouds, no breeze. The real feel was somewhere around 102 for most of the day. And we were out there for hours. It was, it was brutal. And one of the crews had finished up by lunch and they came over and one of the guys, Billy, who was on our team, Billy came over around 1.32 in the afternoon. He's like, hey, I've got fresh hands. You guys need help? We were like, yeah. And Billy starts working for like 15, 20 minutes. He's like, oh, why, do you, why are you guys waiting on the power hammer? I'll use the sledge. 
And I'm like, yeah, you, you go ahead. There's so many swings you can get with a 12 pound sledgehammer in 102 degree heat. Billy swung for about five minutes. He was like, yeah, I'll wait for the power chisel. I'm like, yeah. But Billy looked at me, he and I are side by side. Because once you started knocking down the concrete, then you had to cut out the rebar, then you had to knock out more concrete. There was glass, people had used it as trash, so you couldn't even like go at it with a wet saw or anything because there was so much glass on the inside that was flying out. And Billy at one point, he and I are side by side working. I've got the saws all cutting out rebar. He's got the power chisel freeing up space so I can cut out the rebar. And he just, he kind of stops and he's like, Whew. he and I both take a breather for a second. And he's like, brother, I think there's your question for the day. I was like, what do you mean? And he just looks at me, he's like, this, this is brutal. But the question is, how hard are we willing to work to fight against evil? I mean, what kind of exertion are you willing to put out to fight evil in this world? I was like, ooh, that's a good question, Billy. That's going in the notebook. All right, just quote me. So Billy said that. That is not my question. But that's the question we have to ask ourselves. How hard are we willing to fight against evil? Jude 1.3 says, I found it necessary to write to you appealing you to contend for the faith. And that word that Jude uses for contend, it means literally to struggle upon. And it's talking about with skill and commitment opposing whatever is not of God. Jude says, I found it necessary to write to you appealing to you to struggle against with commitment anything that is not of God. And so we need to ask ourselves individually, and then we need to ask ourselves corporately, how hard are we willing to fight against evil in this world? Because here's what we found with the people of that neighborhood. They were willing to join in the fight. They just needed somebody to start it. They were excited to join in the fight. They just needed somebody to start it. Guys, let's start it here. Let's start it here. I haven't seen any symbols painted in this town like that, but there's evil here. Let's start the fight. And let's fight to the point where we can't lift our arms. And then one of us, somebody will remember, wait a minute, those who wait upon the Lord renew their strength. They'll remember run the race with endurance. They'll remember, what did we talk about a few weeks ago? Relentless pursuit. And in our corporate fight against evil, at different times, different voices will raise up and say, hey, God renews those who wait upon him. Hey, straighten your weary knees. Hey, lift your drooping arms. Be relentless. How hard is this church willing to fight against evil? I'm asking you to join. I intend to fight whether or not you do. But it'll go a lot better if we get more of us fighting. So how hard are we willing to fight? Because it means something. Make no mistake, it does. And then the last thing, uh, we're not doing a closing song, so don't, don't worry, I'm not keeping you here till two. That's a conversation for a later day about how some churches, like the one I visited, are fine with two and a half hours, but we'll have that conversation later. But the last thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about Baruch and Billy. I've used both of their names. Baruch is the one in the very back row. Billy's the one who's overdosed 25 times little bit in front of him. Their stories couldn't be more opposite. Baruch grew up in a Christian home with God-fearing parents, accepted Jesus as a kid, knew he felt called to ministry, came to the United States to go to college for a degree in ministry, and is now working at a church, right? Like, that's a pretty straightforward story. Billy grew up in a non-Christian home with parents who introduced him to drugs, spent years dealing drugs and doing drugs, overdosed 25 times, and so as Billy likes to say, and as Billy frequently says, look, when you want to talk about Jesus raising people from the dead, yeah, I've been there 25 times. And that, that hooks people. Uh, can you explain that a little bit more? Their testimonies could not be more difficult or more different. I learned so much from both Baruch and Billy on this trip. Baruch's a musician, and he brought his guitar everywhere. And if we were standing still for more than, I mean, 60 seconds, he'd grab his guitar and just start playing worship music. And it didn't matter if you joined in or not, Baruch was gonna worship every single chance he got. And I found myself thinking, man, this is what zeal looks like. 
This is what passion for praise looks like. Every single chance Baruch had, and frequently he would create chance that there would be work days, right? And somebody would like, where's Baruch? We need help. And Baruch's over in the corner playing the guitar, singing praise music, right? Like, Baruch, I, I have never met anyone with a passion for worship like Baruch had. It was beautiful. It was, it was so incredible to behold. And, and then Billy. Billy was the same thing, but with his Bible. Billy's Bible went everywhere with him. And if we were standing still for more than 60 seconds, Billy sat down and opened his Bible and began to read. Billy could not get enough of God's Word in his life. And I found myself thinking, man, this is, this is what zeal looks like. This is what passion looks like. This is someone, when David writes about, I delight in the law of the Lord, this is someone who delights in God's Word. And so my question for you, and also my encouragement for you, one I want to ask, does the word zeal describe our approach to praise and to God's word? I mean, if somebody looked at my life, this was so convicting looking at these two guys for a week, right? If someone looked at my life, could they say, man, Sam has a zeal for God's word. Every chance he get, he's pouring himself into it. Every chance he gets, he's praising and worshiping God. He has a zeal for worship and for God's word. And then I also want to encourage you. I shared how their testimonies couldn't be any more different. I mean, when you think of testimonies, right, you think of the exciting testimony. Let's be honest. Like, be honest, right? We, we consider some testimonies more exciting than others. It's more exciting to say I was a drug addict and overdosed 25 times than it is to say, yeah, I grew in a Christian home, accepted Christ at a young age, felt called to ministry at a young age. Like, okay, can we go back to the guy who was a drug addict? But we have to realize that we're all on that spectrum. Some of us have more exciting testimonies than others. But the plain and simple matter is that we all have the same testimony. I was dead, and Jesus raised me from the dead. I mean, that's your testimony. And God used these two testimonies on totally different ends of what we deem to be entertaining to teach people about zeal for him. So wherever your testimony falls, if you're one of those people, and there have been times, I, I, I confess this, that I have selfishly and immaturely sometimes thought, I wish my testimony was more exciting. Like, I wish I had that hook, right? Like, hey, nice to meet you. I died 25 times. You want to hear about it? And there are times where I'm like, man, that would be cool to have that. And then God had to remind me, like, no, your testimony is yours for a reason. So when you meet somebody like Andreas and he talks about refusing to forgive sexual abuse, you can say, oh, been there, dude. Let's talk about that. So wherever you are, God can use your testimony. Wherever you are, God wants to use your testimony. He has given you a story that is yours so that you can point to him as you are meant to do. And this goes back to painting the flower petals. Do everything for the glory of the Lord. Wherever you are, be that person who others look at and say, wow, that is zeal for Jesus. And so this week, and again, this is stuff that we've talked about so many weeks, but these are the questions that God confronted me with in my time in Miami that I've been chewing on, some of them that I have been chewing on, some of them that are new. And so as you consider this week, the challenge, the homework for this week is pick one of these questions and see what Scripture says about it. I mean, if, you, if you've kind of felt, you know, oh, man, that section on do everything for the glory of the Lord, I wonder, pick that and, and really, and so this is why I don't have an assigned scripture passage, because I want you to do the work. But pick one of these questions and see what God's word says about this. And I want to build on James' challenge from last week. James' challenges last week were fantastic. I loved them. James said, pray to God, pray for God to open your eyes to the work he has set before you and seek out opportunities to serve. I saw that in Miami. I mean, pray for God to open your eyes to the opportunities that he set before you. He literally dropped Andreas in our lap. He put Eugene right next to me on the wall when I was grumbling about the work in front of me. So pray that God would open your eyes to the opportunities before you. And then the second challenge that goes hand in hand with that, pray for God to give you a heart of sacrifice. Maybe you've got your own beach day that you don't want to give up to go finish the work in front of you. 
So maybe your prayer needs to be, Lord, grow in me a heart of sight. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So maybe God needs to grow in us a heart of sacrifice, willing to serve. Maybe it's a heart that loves people as he does, so that when you're listening to questions and conversations, you're not staying at the surface. Oh, cool, you said, you know, Jesus, you're wearing a crucifix. I'm sure that's legit. Let's move past this. Pray for a heart that listens and loves like Christ does. Or maybe you feel like there's a concrete pillar in your life, in your community at work. So pray for a heart that fights. Pray for a heart that refuses to stop swinging that sledgehammer. If we can be a church, if we can be a people, if, if it can start with the leadership of wholly sold out to God, Lord, I'm yours. Do with me what you will. Bring conversations into my life. Give me the wisdom to recognize them. Give me the boldness and the ferocity to fight them. I say this many times because I love saying it. Jesus said that the gates of hell can't stand against the church. Gates are defensive. The church is meant to be on the attack. We have been given the weapons to fight the battle in front of us. Let's be a church that picks up those weapons and goes to war every day. All right? We're going to pray and then you guys are dismissed. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you used to teach us. Thank you for the little things that humble us and remind us of really what this life is about. Thank you for how you love us and how you lead us. Thank you for the model that you have set before us. I mean, thank you that we can, as it says in Scripture, that we set our eyes on the perfecter of our faith, on Jesus who is seated at the right hand. Scripture says we lift our eyes and we look at Jesus and that's what enables us to run the race with perseverance and endurance. Lord, may this church be a body that lifts its eyes and sets them on you. May we pray for open doors. May we look for open doors. May we recognize them when you give them. And may we stride through them boldly, proclaiming you to the world. Teach us to love and live like Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Have a great week.